Chapter One of Half a Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Half a Century by Jane Grey Swisshelm. I find life. Those soft pink circles which fell upon my face and hands, caught in my hair, danced around my feet and frolicked over the billowy waves of bright green grass. Did I know they were apple blossoms? Did I know it was an apple tree through which I looked up to the blue sky, over which white clouds scudded away toward the great hills? Had I slept and been awakened by the wind to find myself in the world? It is probable that I had for some time been familiar with that tree and all my surroundings, for I had been breathing two and a half years, and had made some progress in the art of reading and sewing, saying catechism and prayers. I knew the gray kitten which walked away, knew that the girl who brought it back and reproved me for not holding it was Adeline, my nurse. I knew that the young lady who stood near was cousin Sarah Alexander, and that the girl to whom she gave directions about putting bread into a brick oven was Big Jane, that I was Little Jane, and that the white house across the common was Squire Horner's. There was no surprise in anything save the loveliness of blossom and tree, of the grass beneath, and the sky above, and this first indelible imprint on my memory seems to have found this inner something I call me as capable of reasoning as it has ever been. While I sat and wondered, father came, took me in his loving arms, and carried me to mother's room, where she lay in a tent bed with blue foliage and blue birds outlined on the white ground of the curtains, like the apple boughs on the blue and white sky. The cover was turned down, and I was permitted to kiss a baby sister, and warned to be good, lest Mrs. Dampster, who had brought the baby, should come and take it away. This autocrat was pointed out as she sat in a gray dress, white kerchief and cap, and no other potentate has ever inspired me with such reverential awe. My second memory is of a great awakening to a sense of sin, and of my lost and undone condition. On a warm summer day, while walking alone on the common, which lay between home and Squire Horner's house, I was struck motionless by the thought that I had forgotten God. It seemed probable, considering the total depravity of my nature, that I had been thinking bad thoughts, and these I labored to recall, that I might repent and plead with divine mercy for forgiveness, but alas, I could remember nothing save the crowning crime forgetfulness of God. I seemed to stand outside and see myself a mere mite in a pink sunbonnet and white bib, the very chief of sinners, for the probability was I had been thinking of that bonnet and bib. It was quite certain that God knew my sin, and, ah, the crushing horror that I could by no possibility conceal aught from the all-seeing eye, while it was equally impossible to win its approval. The divine law was so perfect that I could not hope to meet its requirements. The divine lawgiver so alert that no sin could escape detection. Under that cloud of doom the sunshine grew dark, and I did not dare to move until a cheery voice called out something about my pretty bonnet and gave me a sense of companionship in this dreadful, dreadful world. Rose, a large native African, had spoken to me from her place in Squire Horner's kitchen, and I went home full of solemn resolves and sad forebodings. This is probably what evangelists would call my conversion, and it came in my third summer. There was a fire in the grate when mother showed Dr. Robert Wilson, our family physician, a pair of wristbands and collar I had stitched for father, and when they spoke of me as not being three years old, but then I had in my mind the marks of that great awakening. To me, no childhood was possible under the training this indicates. Yet in giving that training, my parents were loving and gentle as they were faithful. Believing in the danger of eternal death, 
they could but guard me from it by the only means of which they had any knowledge before the completion of that momentous third year of life i had learned to read the new testament readily and was deeply grieved that our pastor played patty cake with my hands instead of hearing me recite my catechism and talking of original sin during that winter i went regularly to school where i was kept at the head of a spelling class in which were young men and women one of these wilkins mcnair used to carry me home much amused no doubt by my supremacy his father colonel dunning mcnair was proprietor of the village and had been ridiculed for predicting that in the course of human events there would be a graded macadamized road all the way from philadelphia to pittsburgh and that if he did not live to see it his children would he was a neighbor and friend of william wilkins afterwards judge secretary of war and minister to russia and had named his son for him when his prediction was fulfilled and the road made it ran through his land and on it he laid out the village and called it wilkinsburg mr mcnair lived south of it in a rough stone house the manor of the neighborhood with half a dozen slave huts ranged before the kitchen door and the gateway between his grounds and the village as seen from the upper windows of our house was to me the boundary between the known and the unknown the dread portal through which came adam the poor old ragged slave with whom my nurse threatened me when i did not do as she wished he was a wretched creature who made and sold hickory brooms as he dragged his rheumatic limbs on the downgrade of life until he found rest by freezing to death in the woods where he had gone for saplings i was born on the sixth of december eighteen fifteen in pittsburgh on the bank of the monongahela near its confluence with the allegheny my father was thomas cannon and my mother mary scott they were both scotch irish and descended from the scotch reformers on my mother's side were several men and women who signed the solemn league and covenant and defended it to the loss of livings lands and life her mother jane gray was of that family which was allied to royalty and gave to england her nine days queen this grandmother i remember as a stately old lady quaintly and plainly dressed and reading a large bible or answering questions by quotations from its pages she was unsuspicious as an infant always doubtful about actual transgressions of any while believing in the total depravity of all educated in ireland as an heiress she had not been taught to write lest she should marry without the consent of her elder brother guardian she felt that we owed her undying gratitude for bestowing her hand and fortune on our grandfather who was but a yeoman even if he did have a good leasehold ride a high horse wear spurs and have hamilton blood in his veins she made us familiar with the battle of the boyne and the sufferings in londonderry in both of which her great-grandfather had shared but was incapable of that sectarian rancor which marks so many descendants of the men who met on those fields of blood and fought for their convictions in april eighteen sixteen father moved from pittsburgh out to the new village of wilkinsburg took with him a large stock of goods bought property built the house in which i first remember him and planted the apple tree which imprinted the first picture on my memory but the crash which followed the last war with england brought general bankruptcy the mortgages on colonel mcnair's estate made the titles valueless and this with the fall of his real estate in pittsburgh reduced father to poverty from which he never recovered End of chapter 1chapter two of half a century by jane gray swiss helm this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami progress in calvinism hunt ghosts see lafayette ages six to nine my parents were members of the covenanter congregation of which dr john black was pastor for forty-five years he was a man of power a profound logician with great facility in conveying ideas 
to his pulpit ministrations i am largely indebted for whatever ability i have to discriminate between truth and falsehood but the church was in pittsburg and our home seven miles away so we seldom went to meeting the rules of the denomination forbade occasional hearing father and mother had once been sessioned for stopping on their way home to hear the conclusion of a communion service in dr bruce's church which was seceder so our sabbaths were usually spent in religious services at home these i enjoyed as it aided my life work of loving and thinking about god who seemed to my mind to have some special need of my attention nothing was done on that day which could have been done the day before or could be postponed till the day after coffee grinding was not thought of and once when we had no flour for saturday's baking and the buckwheat cakes were baked the evening before and warmed on sabbath morning we were all troubled about the violation of the day there was a presbyterian meeting-house two miles east of wilkinsburg where a large wealthy congregation worshipped rev james graham was pastor and unlike other presbyterians they never profaned the sanctuary by singing human compositions but confined themselves to rouse's version of david's psalms as did our own denomination this aided that laxness of discipline which permitted big jane adeline and brother william to attend sometimes under care of neighbours once i was allowed to accompany them i was the proud possessor of a pair of red shoes which i carried rolled up in my kerchief while we walked the two miles we stopped in the woods my feet were denuded of their commonplace attire and arrayed in white hose beautifully clocked and those precious shoes and my poor conscience tortured about my vanity the girls also exchanged theirs for morocco slippers we concealed our walking shoes under a mossy log and proceeded to the meeting-house it was built in the form of a t of hewn logs and the whole structure both inside and out was a combination of those soft greys and browns with which nature colours wood and in its close setting a primeval forest made a harmonious picture at one side lay a graveyard birds sang in the surrounding trees some of which reached out their giant arms and touched the log walls swallows had built nests under the eaves outside and some on the rough projections inside and joined their twitter to the songs of other birds and the rich organ accompaniment of wind and trees there were two sermons and in the intermission a church sociable in fact if not in name friends who lived twenty miles apart met there exchanged greetings and news gave notices and invitations and obeyed the higher law of kindness under protest of their calvinistic consciences in this breathing time we ate our lunch went to the nearest house and had a drink from the spring which ran through the stone milk-house it was a day full of sightseeing and of solemn grand impressions of the two sermons i remember but one and this from the text many are called but few are chosen and the comments were calvinism of the most rigid school on our way home my brother william three years older than i was very silent and thoughtful for some time then spoke of the sermon of which i entirely approved but he stoutly declared that he did not believe it did not believe god called people to come to him while he did not choose to have them come it would not be fair indeed he thought it would be mean that evening when we were saying the shorter catechism the question what are the decrees of god came to me and after repeating the answer i asked father to explain it not that i needed any explanation but that william might be enlightened for i was anxious about his soul on account of his scepticism enlightened he could not be and even to father expressed his doubts and disapprobation we renewed the discussion when alone and during all his life i laboured with him but soon found the common refuge of orthodox minds in feeling that those especially loved by them will be made exceptions in the general distribution of wrath due to unbelief one day i went with him to hunt the cow we came to a wood just north of the village where the wind roared and shook the trees so that i was quite awe-stricken but he held my hand 
and assured me there was no danger until he suddenly drew back exclaiming oh see as a great tree came crashing down across the path before us and so near that it must have fallen on us if he had not seen it and stepped back even then he refused to go home without the cow and taking up a daddy long legs he inquired of it where she was and started in the direction indicated when we were arrested by the voice of big jane who had come to search for us on reaching home we found a new baby sister elizabeth soon after her birth in april eighteen twenty one father moved back to pittsburgh and lived on sixth street opposite trinity church on property belonging to my maternal grandfather there was no church there at that time but a thickly peopled graveyard which adjoined that of the first presbyterian church on the corner of sixth and wood these were above the level of the street and were protected by a worm fence that ran along the top of a green bank on which we played and gathered flowers grandmother took me sometimes to walk in these graveyards at night and there talked to me about god and heaven and the angels i was sufficiently interested in these but especially longed to see the ghosts and often went to look for them we had a bachelor uncle who delighted in telling us tales of the supernatural and he peopled those graveyards with ghosts in which i believed as implicitly as the revelations made to john on the isle of patmos which were my favorite literature when the congregation concluded to abandon the round church which stood on the triangle between liberty wood and sixth streets and began to dig for a foundation for trinity where it now stands there was a great desecration of graves one day a thrill of excitement and stream of talk ran through the neighborhood about a mrs cooper whose body had been buried three years and was found in a wonderful state of preservation when the coffin was laid open by the diggers it was left that the friends might remove it and that night i felt would be the time for ghosts so i went over alone and while i crouched by the open grave peering in a cloud passed and the moon poured down a flood of light by which i could see the quiet sleeper with folded hands taking her last long rest it was inexpressibly grand solemn and sad there were no gas lights no paved street near no one stirring earth was far away in heaven near at hand but no ghost came and i went home disappointed afterwards i had a still more disheartening adventure i had gone an errand to cousin alexander's on fifth street staying late and coming home found wood street deserted the moon shone brightly but on the graveyard side were heavy shadows except in the open space opposite the church i was on the other side and there was the office of the democratic paper and over the door the motto our country right or wrong this had long appeared to be an uncanny spot owing to the wickedness of this sentiment and i was thinking of the possibility of seeing old nick guarding his property when my attention was attracted to a tall white figure in the bright moonlight outside the graveyard fence i stopped an instant in great surprise and listened for footsteps but no sound accompanied the motion it did not walk but glided and must have risen out of the ground for only a moment before there was nothing visible i clasped my hands in mute wonder but my ghost was getting away and to make its acquaintance i must hurry crossing the street i ran after and gained on it it passed into the shadow of the engine house on across sixth street into the moonlight then into the shadow before i overtook it when lo it was a mortal woman barefoot in a dress which was probably a faded print most prints faded then and this was white long and scant making a very ghostly robe while on her head she carried a bundle tied up in a sheet she had of course come out of virgin alley where many laundresses lived and had just passed out of the shadow when i saw her we exchanged salutations and i went home to lie and brood over the unreliable nature of ghosts i was trying to get into a proper frame of mind for saying my prayers but i doubt if they were said that night as we were soon roused by the cries of fire 
Henry Clay was being burned in effigy on the corner of Sixth and Wood Streets to show somebody's disapproval of his course in the election of John Quincy Adams. The Democratic editor McFarland was tried and found guilty of the offense and took refuge in ridiculing his opponents. Charles Glenn, a fussy old gentleman member of our church, was an important witness for the prosecution, and in the long rhyming account published by the defendant he was thus remembered. Then in came Glenn, that man of peace, and swore to facts as slick as grease. By all his uncle Alex Geese, McFarland burnt the tar barrel. It was before this time that Lafayette revisited Pittsburgh, and people went wild to do him honor. The schools paraded for his inspection, and ours was ranged along the pavement in front of the First Presbyterian Church. The boys next the curb, the girls next the fence, all in holiday attire and wearing blue badges. The distinguished visitor passed up between them, leaning on the arm of another gentleman, bowing and smiling as he went. When he came to where I stood, he stepped aside, laid his hand on my head, turned up my face, and spoke to me. I was too happy to know what he said, and in all the years since that day, that hand has lain on my brow as a consecration. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Half a Century by Jane Gray Swiss Helm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Father's Death, age six to twelve. In the city we went regularly to meeting, and Dr. Black seemed always to talk to me, and I had no more difficulty in understanding his sermons than in mastering the details of the most simple duty. The first of which I preserved the memory was about Peter, who was made to illustrate the growth of crime. He began with boasting. Then came its natural fruit, cowardice in following his master afar off, next falsehood, and from this he proceeded to perjury. It did seem that a disciple of Christ could go no further, but for falsehood and perjury there might be excuse in the hope of reward and Peter found a lower deep, for he began to curse and to swear. A profane swearer is without temptation and serves the devil for the pure love of service. What more could Peter do to prove that he knew not Jesus? In the communion service is a ceremony called fencing the tables, which consists of an appeal to the consciences of intended communicants. Dr. Black began with the first commandment, and forbade those living in its violation to come to the table, and so proceeded through the Decalogue. When he came to the eighth, he straightened himself, placed his hands behind him, and with thrilling emphasis said, I debar from this holy table of the Lord all slaveholders and horse thieves and other dishonest persons, and without another word passed to the ninth commandment. Soon after we returned to the city, Sister Mary died of consumption, and father's health began to fail. I have preserved the spinning wheel on which mother converted flax yarn into thread, which she sold to aid in the support of the family, but soon the entire burden fell on her, for father's illness developed into consumption, from which he died in March 1823. In spite of all the testamentary precautions he could take, whatever of his estate might have been available for present support, was in the hands of lawyers, and mother was left with her children and the debts. There were the contents of his shop and warehouse, some valuable real estate in Pittsburgh, which had passed out of his possession on a claim of ground rent, and a village home minus a title. William was a mechanical genius, so mother set him to making little chairs, which he readily sold, but he liked better to construct fire engines which were quite wonderful, but brought no money. He had a splendid physique, was honorable and faithful, and if mother had been guided by natural instinct in governing him, all would have been well. But he never met the requirements of the elders of the church, who felt it their duty to manage our family affairs, 
so he was often in trouble and i who gloried in him contrived to shield him from many a storm at this time there was a fashionable furor for lace work mother sent me to learn it and then procured me pupils whom i taught usually sitting on their knee but lace work soon gave way to painting on velvet this too i learned and found profit in selling pictures ah what pictures i did make i reached the culminating glory of artist life when judge braden of butler gave me a new crisp five dollar bill for a goddess of liberty indeed he wanted me to be educated for an artist and was far-seeing and generous enough to have been my permanent patron had an artistic education or any other education been possible for a western pennsylvania girl in that dark age the first half of the nineteenth century mother made a discovery in the art of colouring leghorn and straw bonnets which brought her plenty of work so we never lacked comforts of life although grandfather's executors made us pay rent for the house we occupied End of chapter three chapter four of half a century by jane gray swiss helm this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami go to boarding school age twelve during my childhood there were no public schools in pennsylvania the state was pretty well supplied with colleges for boys while girls were permitted to go to subscription schools to these we were sent part of the time and in one of them joseph caldwell afterwards a prominent missionary to india was a schoolmate but we had dr black's sermons full of grand morals science and history in lieu of colleges for girls there were boarding schools and edgeworth was esteemed one of the best in the state it was at braddock's field and mrs oliver an englishwoman of high culture was its founder and principal to it my cousin mary alexander was sent but returned homesick and refused to go back unless i went with her it was arranged that i should go for a few weeks as i was greatly in need of country air and highly delighted i was at the rendezvous at the hour one o'clock with my box ready for this excursion into the world of polite literature mary was also there and a new scholar but father oliver did not come for us until four o'clock he was a small nervous gentleman and lamps were already lighted in the smoky city when we started to drive twelve miles through spring mud on a cloudy cheerless afternoon we knew he had no confidence in his power to manage those horses though we also knew he would do his best to save us from harm but as darkness closed around us i think we felt like babes in the woods and shuddered with vague fear as much as with cold and damp when we reached the bullock pens half a mile west of wilkinsburg there were many lights and much bustle in and around the old yellow tavern where teamsters were attending to their weary horses here we turned off to the old mud road and came to a place of which i had no previous knowledge a place of outer darkness and chattering teeth we met no more teams saw no more lights but seemed to be in an utterly uninhabited country then after an hour of wearisome jolting and plunging we discovered that the darkness had not been total for the line of the horizon had been visible but now it was swallowed up we knew we were in a wood by the rush of the wind amid the dried white oak leaves knew that the road grew rougher at every step that our driver became more nervous as he applied the brake and we went down down still the descent grew steeper we stopped and father oliver felt for the bank with his whip to be sure we were on the road then we heard the sound of rushing angry waters mingled with the roar of the wind and he seemed to hesitate about going on but we could not very well stay there and he once more put his horses in motion while we held fast and prayed silently to the great deliverer after stopping again and feeling for the bank lest we should go over the precipitous hillside which he knew was there 
he proceeded until with a great plunge we were in the angry waters which rose to the wagon bed and roared and surged all around us the horses tried to go on when something gave way and our guardian concluded further progress was impossible and began to hello at the top of his voice for a long time there was no response then came an answering call from a long distance next a light appeared and that too was far away but came toward us when it reached the brink of the water and two men with it we felt safe the light bearer held it up so that we saw him quite well and his peculiar appearance suited his surroundings he was more an overgrown boy than a man beardless with a long swarthy face black hair and keen black eyes he wore heavy boots outside his pantaloons a blouse and slouch hat spoke to his companion as one having authority and with a laugh said to our small gentleman is this where you are but gave no heed to the answer as he waded in and threw off the check line saying i wonder you did not drown your horses he next examined the wagon paying no more attention to father oliver's explanations than to the water in which he seemed quite at home and when he had finished his inspection he said they must go to the house and handing the light to the driver he took us up one by one and carried us to the wet bank as easily as a child carries her doll he gave some directions to his companion took the light and said to us come on and we walked after him out into the limitless blackness nothing doubting we went what seemed a long way following this brigand-looking stranger without seeing any sign of life or hearing any sound save the roar of wind and water but on turning a fence corner we came in sight of a large two-story house with a bright light streaming out through many windows and a wide open door there was a large stone barn on the other side of the road and to this our conductor turned saying to us go on to the house this we did and were met at the open door by a middle-aged woman shading with one hand the candle held in the other this threw a strong light on her face which instantly reminded me of an eagle she wore a double-bordered white cap over her black hair and looked suspiciously at us through her small keen black eyes but kindly bade us come in to a low wainscoted hall with broad stairway and many open doors through one of these and a second door we saw a great fire of logs and i should have liked to sit by it but she led us into a square wainscoted room on the opposite side in which blazed a coal fire almost as large as the log heap in the kitchen she gave us seats and a white-haired man who sat on the corner spoke to us and made me feel comfortable up to this time all the surroundings had had an air of enchanted castles brigands ghosts witches the alert woman with the eagle face in spite of her kindness made me feel myself an object of doubtful character but this old man set me quite at ease we were no more than well warmed when the wagon drove to the door and the boy man with the lantern appeared saying come on we followed him again and he lifted us into the wagon while the mistress of the house stood on the large flagstone doorstep shading her candle flame and giving us directions about our wraps coming events cast their shadows before when they are between us and the light but that night the light must have been between them and me for i bade good night to our hostess without any premonition we should ever again meet or that i should sit alone as i do to-night over half a century later in that same old wainscoted room listening to the roar of those same angry waters and the rush of the wind wrestling with the groaning trees in the dense darkness of this low valley when we had been carefully bestowed in the wagon our deliverer took up his lantern saying to father oliver drive on he was obeyed and led the way over a bridge across another noisy stream and along a road where there was the sound of a waterfall very near then up a steep rocky way until he stopped saying i guess you can get along now to father oliver's thanks he only replied by a low contemptuous but good-humoured laugh as he turned to retrace his steps all comfort and strength and hope seemed to go with him we were abandoned to our fate babes in the woods again with only god for our reliance 
but after a while we could see the horizon and arrived at our destination several minutes before midnight to find the great mansion full of glancing lights and busy expectant life the large family had waited up for father oliver's return for he and his wagon were the connecting link between that establishment and the outside world he appeared to great advantage surrounded by a bevy of girls clamouring for letters and messages to me the scene was fairyland i had never before seen anything so grand as the great hall with its polished stairway we had supper in the housekeeper's room and i was taken up this stairway and then up and up a corkscrew cousin until we reached the attic which stretched over the whole house one great dormitory called the beehive here i was to sleep with helen semple a pittsburgh girl of about my own age a frail blonde who quite won my heart at our first meeting next day was sabbath and i was greatly surprised to see pupils walk on the lawn this was such a desecration of the day but i made no remark i was too solemnly impressed by the grandeur of being at braddock's field to have hinted that anything could be wrong but for my own share in the violation i was painfully penitent this was not new for there were a long series of years in which the principal business of six days of every week was repentance for the very poor use made of the seventh and from this dreary treadmill of sin and sorrow no faith ever could or did free me i never could see salvation in christ apart from salvation from sin and while the sin remained the salvation was doubtful and the sorrow certain on the afternoon of that first sabbath a number of young lady pupils came to the beehive for a visit and as i afterwards learned to inspect and name the two new girls when i was promptly and unanimously dubbed wax doll after a time one remarked that they must go and study their ancient history lesson i caught greedily at the words ancient history ah if i could only be permitted to study such a lesson no such progress or promotion seemed open to me but the thought interfered with my prayers and followed me into the realm of sleep so when that class was called next forenoon i was alert and what was my surprise to hear those privileged girls stumbling over the story of samson could it be possible that was ancient history how did it come to pass that every one did not know all about samson the man who laid his head on delilah's wicked lap to be shorn of his strength if there is anything in that account or any lesson to be learned from it with which i was not then familiar it is something i have never learned indeed i seem to have completed my theological education before i did my twelfth year one morning mrs oliver sent for me and told me she had learned my mother was not able to send me to school but if i would take charge of the lessons of the little girls she would furnish me board and tuition this most generous offer quite took my breath away and was most gladly accepted but it was easy work and i wondered my own studies were so light i was allowed to amuse myself drawing flowers which were quite a surprise and pronounced better than anything the drawing-master could do to recite poetry for the benefit of the larger girls and to play in the orchard with my pupils with the other girls i became interested in hairdressing i had read the children of the abbey and amanda's romantic adventures enchanted me but she was quite outside my life now i made a nearer acquaintance with her she changed her residence so had i she had brown ringlets i too should have them so one friday night my hair was put up in papers and next morning i let loose an amazing shower of curls the next thing to do was to go off alone and sit reading in a romantic spot of course i did not expect to meet lord mortimer miss fitzallen never had any such expectations i was simply going out to read and admire the beauties of nature when i had seated myself in proper attitude on the gnarled root of an old tree overhanging a lovely ravine i proceeded to the reading part of the play and must of course be too much absorbed to hear the approaching footsteps to which i listened with bated breath so i did not look up when they stopped at my side or until a pleasant voice said why you look quite romantic my dear then i saw miss oliver the head-teacher familiarly called sissy jane 
in that real and beautiful presence miss fitzallen retired to her old place and oh the mortification she left behind her i looked up a detected criminal into the face of her who had brought to me this humiliation and took her for a model my folly did not prevent our being sincere friends during all her earnest and beautiful life she passed on and i got back to the beehive when i disposed of my curls and never again played heroine End of chapter four